Hello and welcome. My name is Georg Dietz. I'm the editor-in-chief of the New Institute. I'm really pleased to welcome Lea Epi to this uh, new episode of Work in Progress, Conversations from the Construction Side of the New Institute in Hamburg. Lea Epi is a professor for political theory at the London School of Economics and a future fellow or soon a fellow at the New Institute uh, from August on. She wrote about global justice, partisanship, uh, upcoming book about Kant and the architectonic of reason and uh, beautifully written um, political wounded memoir, autobiography, uh, whatever sort of the genre really is, um, free out uh, this fall as well. So um, Leah, what made you write this book? As you say, this is a book that is partly autobiographic and partly political, philosophical, and it's a reflection on freedom, um, freedom seen through the lives and the experiences and the conflicts and the tensions of the different characters that I kind of came to know in my childhood. What made me write the book was my interest in freedom and uh, my philosophical interest in freedom and the um, question of how freedom gets instantiated in different political systems and also how it gets betrayed by different political systems. Um, and so freedom as an ideal and freedom as an institutional reality and the conflict between those two. I had gotten to a point in my research where I was interested in the relationship between liberalism and socialism and the ideas of freedom that underpin both the liberal and the socialist traditions and uh, the commonalities between those. And uh, I had gotten to a point in my studies where I was increasingly interested in Marx and Marxism and um, not in the way which is more common among Marxists, at least analytical Anglo-Saxon Marxists these days, which is, you know, the ideas of justice and exploitation um, but I was interested in the questions of political power and what happens when you want to realize certain ideas of justice and solidarity and exploitation. And so I came to, uh, in my career, I came to a point where I was writing Marx articles on the dictatorship of the proletariat and how uh, Marx conceives that idea and how it's justified, justified and so on. And then it dawned on me that these ideas were all somehow already in me and in fact had been with me from very, very early age because I grew up in Albania and uh, I lived my first 10 years of life under communism in Albania. And we had moral education classes, people were talking about Marxist ideas all the time as inspirations for the actions of everyone from nursery school children to um, yeah, nursery school, university workers, everyone in society was uh, motivated by these ideas. And so for me, it became, uh, I got to a point where I felt um, sort of almost alienated, actually, because I thought, well, I'm studying these ideas and I'm studying, you know, the politics of Marxism and I'm studying the dictatorship of the proletariat, but actually I've also lived it. And so what is there, what do these experiences have in common and what do they tell us about each other? And uh, and, and so I started this sort of, it was almost like a psychoanalytic treatment <laughs> I was doing to myself by writing this book, trying to find out how I came to read and be interested and defend these ideas given where I started and given the both family and societal background. Yeah. So. Well, let's go into that because I really think your pol book is politically very relevant as it is a prehistory of some of the contradictions um, of freedom as a practice or ideology in more than one system, as you say. So it's not only socialism that you say it has a strange approach to freedom, but I, I don't sort of want to spoil the reader, but I think also in liberalism you see a quite ambivalent or contradictory notion of, of freedom at work or practice sort of, uh, in, in the rhetoric or, or in the market themselves. So, but, but the book really is a childhood memory. So it is, it is uh, about this girl in the fig tree with a view of the sea um, hiding from parents or sort of in the, in the Garden of the Neighbors, it's this beautiful scene. Who is this, who is this girl? Who is this young Leah? Um, so it's a, a, a young girl of around 10, 
who uh, is growing up in this seaside town of Duras on the Adriatic coast in Albania and is on the cusp of making the transition from childhood to adulthood and whose um, personal and cognitive and emotional development coincides with the kind of cognitive and uh, political developments uh, of the country and the transition from childhood to adulthood in her life coincides with the transition from one political system to the other in her country. And so the story is really a story of transition, both at the individual level, but also at the country level. And the, the, the story, the narrative is focused around a child who experiences this transition in a rather traumatic way, uh, which is also how the country experiences this transition and begins to um, think about freedom for the first time and to understand that the ideas of freedom that she had known up to that point, so to the age of 10, 11, to the point of making this transition from childhood to, um, to adulthood, were uh, not what she thought they were. And uh, that, moreover, the two kind of main sites of influence, the state and the family, are also in tension and contrast with each other in how they deliver these ideas and what they tell her about these ideas. And so the story is really a story of kind of coming to trying to come to terms with what freedom is, both at the individual level, at the societal level, at the systemic level, and also with the um, failures and the remainders of uh, this idea of freedom when institutions actually don't live up to it in different political systems. And so, um, yeah, and so it's a story of, you know, growing up in a particular country, which experiences this transition in a traumatic way, growing up in a particular family, which has a stance towards the state that is also traumatic for the child who is grown up and sort of socialized in um, socialist ideals. And, uh, and it's also a story which uh, shows you in a way that where you come from and which, you know, which social group you belong to, which social class uh, you um, experience in a way shapes the kind of opportunities that you have in the future and which was extreme in the case of this young girl because uh, these different formative influences uh, pull in different directions and so in the book there isn't really a unified interpretation of you know the, the purposes and the motives of the different characters there is more a kind of effort to show how these different stories shape the um, the self-understanding of someone who grows up in that traumatic context where all these things go on at once. Yeah. You use the word trauma a lot, sort of in your answer. Um, and I think that the book sort of talks about that in a very um, elegant way, sort of uh, leading up to the civil war of 1997, uh, where, where the trauma sort of becomes most sort of palpable. When would you say you, you realized that you were traumatized, or, or how would you describe that process of understanding? And is it still with you? Because I think it's, it's yeah. interesting we say about this political and the personal level. And, right. the, and the, in the European context, I think this word trauma is really relevant to understand a lot of the political developments of the last um, 15 to 20 years so in, 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 in post communist societies and in market economies as well. But, but you make this very personal sort of point about about the trauma and I'm yeah, curious yeah. about that yeah so I I guess I was uh, traumatized twice within a distance of you know seven years the first time was in 1990 um, Albania experienced this transition from communism a year later so when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 Albania was a very isolated country and a very uh, it was a limit case almost in how it had experienced its communism because it always criticized a lot of the other socialist countries around the world for being too revisionist and so for not really standing up for the ideals of socialism, of glo global socialism. Even though it was a very isolated context, it was a country in which, you know, the GDR, the Soviet Union, China, Yugoslavia, Cuba, Vietnam, whatever, what name you want to give, all of these countries had in some ways betrayed socialism. And so Albania was presented in everyday formative experiences as the only country in the world that was standing up for socialism and was actually also making the sacrifices required to realize socialism. And I was in Albania at the age in which uh, I was just a child, basically. So all my experiences of socialism were the everyday experiences of, you know, going to nursery, being with your parents, going to a pioneer's camp, 
doing all the sort of day-to-day -day socializing. And, and, and where for a child, this was an extremely free context because you would, you know, you could play in the streets, there was no cars, you couldn't be, you, it wasn't, neighbors looked after you, uh, you could just, you know, go out and see your friends at any point of the day. And so it was, and, and you know, parents were very relaxed with each other, teachers were generally quite nice. So this was for me, you know, a society of maximal freedom and in which you try and, and then you also a society which, which believes in something, right? Which believes in this idea of socialism, which thinks about other parts of the world, even though it's a very isolated contract, very much. And about, you know, what it can do to help these other oppressed countries and oppressed groups of people. So for me, the first trauma was in 1990. And, and, and as I said, because I was not an adult in Albania during communism, I had never thought about political censorship or about ideas of, you know, individual expression or freedom of association, all the kinds of things that grown-ups would have been concerned by, the lack of um, political pluralism, you know, all the political liberties. For a child who is 9, 10, this is all not really relevant. It's somehow not part of your mental horizon. So I was just, you know, I was a good uh, socialist child and I was growing up in this socialist context and I loved my party and I loved, you know, Uncle Enver, who was Enver Hoja, who had died and I remember very well his death, which was also a very um, deep moment for the kind of political development because we were told, you know, he's dead, but uh, his ideas live and of course, you know, we need to kind of do what we can. So, um, so for me, the first time in which I just thought, wow, this is, you know, it's not a free context. <laughs> this is not a free country, or this may not be a free country, was when uh, I, I sort of stumbled on a protest by mistake, and I heard these people shouting freedom and democracy, and, you know, I saw police and dogs were following them. And I remember on television, they were being uh, introduced as hooligans. And I asked my father, what are these hooligans? You know, what, what are hooligans? And he said, oh, you know, hooligans, they're only in the West. They just shout and make a lot of trouble and, uh, you know, we don't really have them. We only have some, but uh, it's okay, it's under control. And then slowly within the, uh, these weeks of transition, I um, discovered that actually the views of my parents were not that aligned to the views that I was receiving in school or through the television about these protests and about the, um, the values of socialism and how they were realized in Albania. So the first moment was one where I thought that at some point I realized that my family didn't actually believe the same things that I believed in this system and where I wondered why are they are they lying to me or why are they you know concealing things from me and you know who is right here is the school right is my teacher right who is telling me that these are hooligans and so on or is it my parents who you know have always said yes of course we live in a free state and so on and suddenly they care so much about freedom and, freedom and democracy and it looks like freedom and democracy are not the things that we have but the kinds of things that we might want. So that's the first kind of trauma where you just, you know, you're already growing up, and so you're already in this age where you're questioning your parents' authority, but suddenly your parents' authority is, so, is questioned at such a deep level that there is nothing that you can take from granted about what you see and, you know, what goes on around you. So that's the first trauma. And then this, and then, so this was all about socialism and kind of unlearning all the things that I had learned about how great socialism was. And, uh, and the second time was the, uh, in 1997, where after the first sort of traumatic, uh, this, you know, the shock therapy and the liberalization efforts and the uh, reforms that were imported, you know, this idea of structural reforms that were implemented with the push from the World Bank and all the IMF, financial, international financial institutions, there was this idea that we need to now liberalize these societies and we need to privatize and, you know, we need to make sure that they're ready for a market economy. And we know that the market economy, this transition to a market economy will be painful, but, you know, it will deliver. And that's why it was called the shock therapy, because the idea was if you kind of deliver these therapies, they're quite, you know, they will cause unemployment, they will cause um, fallout for people, as long as they believe in the idea they will be able to, um, to make the transition and it will, it's going to work out for everyone. And this all collapses in 97 because um, in this uh, wave of liberalization, privatization, free initiative and so on, there's a lot of pyramid schemes uh, that emerge and where people put all their savings, they sell their houses and uh, they just, you know, they have this massive confidence that the market will work and the market will deliver for everyone. And it goes so badly that eventually everyone loses their savings and the state also loses control over the territory. And then because people are so angry, they loot 
uh, weapons and they get everybody gets an assault weapon. So basically the state no longer even has the monopoly over the use of force, which it had at, had at least in sort of 1990s. And 97 is the second traumatic moment where you realize, hang on, all these ideals of socialism in 91, we were told, 1990, we were told that they didn't work. And then in 97, all these ideas of liberalism, I can also see that they're not quite working because the system is collapsing again and the state is unable to kind of, you know, even protect basic peace and basic security. There's dead people everywhere and everybody's trying to leave the country and, you know, they drown as they make these very perilous crossings and so on. So this is a kind of doubly traumatic moment because I guess it's an experience of disillusionment with two systems, both of which claim to be the embodiment of freedom and democracy. The interesting thing about the book, I think, is the beautiful thing about the book is that you operate with a novelist's mind somehow. So if you have this uh, child perspective, it's interesting what you say so that you describe it as sort of understanding that your parents were not honest with you or, or, or were hiding something from you. But still, there were all these uh, fault lines or these indicators in your childhood, in a way, of, of this, I don't know, alienation or... or this, pre this family histories of ominous science and then very comical elements as well so sort of, um, the, the coca-cola can this magical thing that was dropped from somewhere so sort of those venerated worshipped even um, and, and and the sun lotion of the tourists so that that made you realize they are different um, can you describe that process yeah. of looking at the world in, in a difference sort of from the political sort of reckoning that came later so basically, um, there is, uh, I mean, there is two things going on there. The one is the sort of the perspective of the of the family, where you say, I think you're right to say that there are these kind of early indications that something is different. And uh, and I knew as I was growing up that something was different. So uh, for for a start, I my first language was French, and uh, I had a grandmother who I was very fond of, who spoke French to me from you know the day I was born, basically, and she always spoke French to me, but she wasn't French. We had never, she had never been to France. France is not a country we had any relatives. Uh, we, you know, it was just a sort of, for me, a, just a weird association. And so I, I grew up speaking French and knowing that I was the odd child who could speak French before she could speak Albanian and was sent to nursery, knowing very few words of, uh, of Albanian, speaking mostly French. And then, you know, I also had, you know, my, my, my mother and my grandmother, they, they brought me up with a particular way of dressing up as well. You know, I had this, uh, these handmade lace dress dresses and uh, these uh, things that were kind of basically sewn, hand sewn in Albania, but from fashion magazines adapted from the West, so, so smuggled from the West into Albania and then turned into something uh, that also stood out because in Albania all the clothes were kind of mass produced, so you could only buy a certain kind of cardigan and a certain kind of jumper and certain kind of trousers, and everybody had the same. And so I also also my way of going around basically was very different. So there was definitely a sense that there was something different in my family. And also my, my parents and uh, my grandmother and my family relatives and so on, some of them came and spoke French to each other. And sometimes they spoke of, you know, remote contexts. They spoke of, you know, boats in Greece and opera stalls in Milan. And so they, they spoke of a world which I had no access to, which somehow seemed relevant and they were uh, connected to it but which I was not connected to it at all. And so for me, what was only left was this kind of mystery of uh, there's all these strange things going on. And when I asked, why are we speaking French? My grandmother would say, oh, it's, you know, it's the language of the French Revolution or so something like <laughs> completely random. It's not a good explanation. So it, it was only very late and it was only with the transition that I described, that, uh, that I discovered that uh, the reason she had been speaking French to me was that she came from this um, elite Albanian family who had been posted in the Ottoman Empire and, uh, you know, her, her grandfather. So they were all basically aristocrats who had been, who spent most of their life outside Albania running the Ottoman Empire and for whom French was like, just like, you know, in the Russian 19th century novels was the language of interaction. And the, the reason she spoke French to me was that she was having, it was almost like an identity marker for her that, you know, she had lost everything during communism, but there were some things that couldn't be taken away from her and that through that she was connecting to her past in a way by... Um, yeah, and, and so this is the sort of the, the, the family side of things. It's the family, mis family mystery side of things. And then there is the, um, the Albanian context side of things, which were much more common. And so, for example, the fact that people would um, exhibit Coca-Cola cans because they were markers of, of social status. Uh, 
and they suggested that someone in the family had been in the West and had had access to, we had no, we didn't have Coca-Cola in Albania, we didn't have, like the drink was not known. We didn't even know it was a drink actually, we only had the cans. So, uh, so these cans were kind of imported from, um, from the West and often displayed on bookshelves in particular families, you know, if you had access to them. So they were kind of markers of, of social status and, and often the cause of, um, as I described in the book, family neighborly disputes and um, yeah, completely odd objects that you wouldn't think would cause rifts between family or between neighbors or would kind of break good neighborly relations. What you hint at is this, this darkness of the family history. There were a lot of deaths and, and, and sort of um, in, in the family or sort of suicide. And um, the, the prehistory, as you describe it, of, of, of this family or the, the context of this family, which is this cosmopolitan context, I guess, of the um, Ottoman Empire as opposed to this internationalist uh, appeal at some point, at least for, for, some, for, for some while, at least in socialism, um, how did this, um, maybe also the dark side, but also the, 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 the cosmopolitan reality influence just thinking, maybe also as an academic later when you wrote a book about global justice and then you sort of try to reconcile or I don't know how you describe it, the position of the cosmopolitans or cosmopo yeah, and, and the statists so who believe more in the, in the nation, nation state and, and you, you, you had a you came up with in, the, in the middle or some way or more, more on cosmopolitan side, but you saw the function of the state. Can you explain that a little, how, how yeah, your biography shaped your, your work as an academic in that example? Yeah, uh, so one of the things that I was really interested in my book was to try and, in, in my global justice work and sort of my academic books, what I, what I was always interested in is uh, the fact that political membership doesn't establish the boundaries of oppression, that, um, that you can have um, oppression that cuts across political boundaries, and that, uh, and that often internal differences between classes of people within one country or, uh, you know, differences between genders or whatever, there's all this kind of axis of oppression that could be much more relevant than this one way in which we think about the uh, unequal development in the world, which is it's all due to political membership. So I was interested in, uh, in, in my academic work in exploring this idea of the state as a very significant political agent to realize certain things, to make certain initiatives feasible and to, uh, to initiate certain reforms and so on and to carry through, but as not intrinsically morally relevant. And so for me, the state was always an agent rather than something that decided whether, you know, what the scope of the claims is. And so whether, for example, equality only holds between members of the state and not outsiders, or what people owe to each other depends on which country they're born into. And I guess the, the family experience was one where, um, yes, so my family was Albanian, we lived in Albanian, but it was such an unusual Albanian family that it wasn't really, being, being Albanian was part of the identity, but it was more an identity that I inherited from the school and from the education system, rather than something that came from the family, where uh, class identity was much more important. and for understandable reasons, because their entire life had been determined by them being part of particular social classes. So on my mother's side, they were uh, property owners. And as I say, on my father's side, they were these sort of intellectual um, aristocratic elites. And so, and these two things, and, and both of them were uh, enemies of the socialist state, but for different reasons. And they were also at, at war with each other in a way, because they had different values and they saw life in a very different way. You know, my, family, my mother's family was very kind of bourgeois and saving and my uh, grandmother's family was a very different way of thinking about uh, money and you know what you spend and how you spend and honors and titles were much more important so basically in my upbringing these differences of social class were much more important for example than the uh, ethnic or um, religious differences which were not at all significant and so i suppose when i approached this work on global justice where the question was what is the moral standing of states and you know what does state belonging to? What does national identity do? Does it equalize people or does it mean that, you know, the claims that we have, uh, the claims of justice, for example, that our fellow citizens have are more important than the claims of justice to distant strangers? For me, this was all intuitively wrong because I had never grown up with this kind of strong uh, political identity. There were always many identities going on and, uh, and it was often a question of contingency and political circumstance, how they developed, and, you know, what conflicts there were between these different identities. 
Well, you at some point thought, or that's what you write in the book, um, uh, that you always thought there was nothing better than communism growing up in, in Albania. And you had this family tradition where you had a favorite fruit, uh, which was the fig, I guess, in your case, uh, due to the fig tree, I guess, and then the Russian Revolution. Um, so can you explain that, that choice uh, of, of revolution as opposed to, I think, your father was, no, the French Revolution was your grandmother then, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, so my, everybody had their favorite revolution. So my mother, who came from this uh, bourgeois property-owning family, her favorite revolution was the English Revolution. And, and my grandmother was, even though she came from this aristocratic background, she was very, a very progressive, enlightened person. And her, so her, her favorite revolution was the Russian, the French Revolution. And, uh, and my father was, he didn't have a favorite revolution because he never believed that, you know, um, there had been any revolution. There were only, for him, there were only revolutionaries. There were only individuals who fought against the system. And, uh, and for him, his entire worldview was being against something as opposed to being for something. In fact, when you had to be for something, you often saw just betrayal and responsibility that he could not bear and, um, and disappointment. And so that's why he didn't have a favorite revolution. My favorite revolution was Russian because it was a revolution that we spoke about in school. And, uh, you know, there was this idea that history, well, a very, you know, straightforward Marxist idea, you know, history is class struggle and, you know, nations and classes are on the world stage trying to kind of realize their material needs, there is relation to production and force of production and so on, and they change historically, uh, circumstances change. But, uh, and, and there's a sense in which this, there's this kind of progressive march of history, which with every revolution, a, a disenfranchised group becomes enfranchised. And so, you know, the French Revolution was a kind of... The English Revolution is a precursor, then there's a the French Revolution, and then, of course, there's the Bolshevik Revolution, which is a socialist revolution. So that's why that's the kind of the most significant of all. And I like it because, in some ways, it wasn't our revolution, but it was... Because it wasn't, it wasn't Albanian, but in some ways it was the revolution after which we had modeled and that we were still carrying the torch for because... At that point, the Soviet Union had already gone through uh, the uh, 20th Congress and, you know, it was already Khrushchev after Stalin and so on. Whereas Albania was the only country that was still saying that we stand with Stalin and we stand with this kind of pure uh, communism that needs to be realized everywhere in the world. And we're sort of carrying the torch on behalf of that communism. So that's why I liked it, because this was like responding better to the way in which in school we articulated these ideas of, of freedom and how revolutions, different revolutions realize these different ideas of freedom. You talk about your father and both your parents are really interesting characters in the, in the book in a very um, ambivalent way, a contradictory way in some way or, or a conflictual way. Um, you say your father didn't really believe in revolutions, but only revolutionaries. Um, that's Quite beautiful statement, and, and, and you, you write about him with a great sense of love, but also sort of understanding of his um, tr tragedy in some way, which is also in that sort of dream dreamer approach to life, um, the unfinished, uh, looking for yeah, sort of knowing how to finish anything basically. Um, how would you describe him um, in, in, in your in, in the course of the book? I mean, he, he has an interesting journey, quite quite a quite some journey from, but maybe you, you can describe him, um, how, how, you, how, you, how you see him, um, yeah, or so, saw him. Uh, yeah, so, so basically my father came from this, uh, from this family in which, uh, you know, they were intellectual elites and then had, uh, with the transition, with, with communism winning the elections, the first three elections in Albania in 1946, my grandfather went to prison and my grandmother was deported. And so my, my father basically grew up uh, without his father and with only his mother and, uh, and, and lived his entire life marked by this idea that, you know, your biography is one where um, it's your, the first thing that introduces you is which, which family you come from. He was also named after the, uh, one of the Albanian prime ministers who was uh, very significant in uh, giving the Albanian crown to the fascists when they occupied Albania. So it was almost like a kind of whistling figure. And, uh, and for my entire childhood, I had thought that these two things that my father was named after this prime minister were, were just a coincidence and something that he had to kind of make excuses for. Excuses for. Uh, 
until uh, very late when I discovered that it wasn't actually the coincidence that this was his grandfather. And so there was a reason why he was called the same. <laughs> and so he has this transition of being someone who is on the receiving end of class struggle for the first 10 years of my life, so for the socialist period. And then in the liberal period, the fates turn and the family is in some ways rehabilitated. It's now on the kind of winner's side because liberalism returns. And my father becomes a CEO at the port of Duros and is suddenly responsible for these privatizing projects and for sacking a whole bunch of people in the name of modernizing and uh, saving costs and saving labor and so on and so forth. And he really struggled with that transition. He really struggled with the idea that um, he had been a victim up to 1990, but now he was someone who actually had to make these decisions and take responsibility for uh, the disenfranchisement and for the oppression of others in a way, because to make people lose their jobs is, you know, was something that was really heavy on his conscience and he just couldn't accept it. And the fact that people would say, you know, the World Bank representatives would say, oh, don't worry, this is just what structural reforms require and uh, the markets will adapt. And for him, this was like what people always say when they have an idea and then that you do what it takes to realize that idea, but then they don't realize that this always has a cost. And he knew that it had a cost because of his own life up to that point. And, um, and so he really struggled with that idea. In, my, in the book, my parents are almost like different ways of thinking about freedom. So my mother is much more, um, um, she's much more committed to uh, liberalism and to capitalism with understanding all the shadows and all the compromises that need to be made. And, uh, and so she's almost someone who embodies the kind of the liberal idea of freedom. You know, you are free if, uh, and this kind of negative idea of freedom, which is you are free if no one tells you what to do or what to say or what to wear, then that's all it takes to be a free human being. Whereas for my father, he was much more uh, interested or, and committed to this different way of understanding freedom, which is positive freedom. You know, this idea that it's not freedom from, but freedom to, to have certain opportunities and to be a kind of person that, um, that has these opportunities. And that when that is absent, the negative freedom is not enough. And so he could see what the problems were with this kind of liberal idea, with this sort of negative idea of freedom. So it was, it's an interesting, it was always an interesting conflict between my parents because they were always bringing out this, I mean, I wasn't able to articulate this at the time, but then later on when I was studying these things philosophically, I always thought these were ways in which these people were actually bringing out these conflicts that seemed like very abstract philosophical conflicts, but that suddenly you thought about their lives and you realize that they weren't as abstract in the end. You know, they were the day to day of my sort of childhood in Albania and the kind of things, the decisions that we thought about and the things we talked about. And my father struggling and not sleeping because there were these Roma people in the port that he had to sack. This was like a really uh, formative influence on me. It was really fundamental actually to kind of think about that and the fact that. He was not unable to sign these papers, and every time he came home and said, look, I can't do it. I know they say I must do it. But anyway, this sort of struggles of conscience almost. Yeah. As you say, it feels almost, in a way, like a prehistory of the um, contradictions of market economy or market-based liberalism or, or the way the, um, the, the word freedom nowadays is really um, trivialized in, in the political or media um, context, I, I would say. And, and you make a very complicated, interesting argument in a way that, that would lead, I think, in some way to thinking that you would see the word or the concept of democracy itself sort of not inherently as a given or, or, or a bit skeptical. So if you would like to, to question that. And that has to do with this notion of, of freedom, I guess. And that so if you describe in this very beautiful sentence uh, that I would like to, 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 to introduce to the interview and then sort of maybe you can explain your ambivalence towards this, this term. Um, when freedom finally arrived, it was like a dish served frozen. We chewed a little, swallowed fast and remained hungry. Some wondered if we had been given leftovers. What's this freedom and how, how is it, um, yeah, how, how is it maybe, maybe misintroduced or, 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 or wrongly introduced into the, the, the post-communist context in Europe? Mm. So I think, um, the, I mean, the reason I say that, all that, is that for me, at this point of my transition and at this point in my life, freedom was just a name. And it was the name of something that I believed we had had and suddenly discovered that we didn't have it. And suddenly, you know, I was told we now had it 
And then in 1997, you know, when the civil war broke out and, uh, you know, there were guns everywhere and so on, you kind of thought, well, what did we actually get? Were we actually given this? And so, uh, and I use the term with this ambivalence because I felt that my confusion at the time about what this freedom to, uh, you know, the freedom that came after the end of communism really was, the kind of confusion that I had as a child was not just the confusion of a child. I felt often afterwards that this was a kind of general collective confusion, that people knew what they were against, but they didn't really have the categories to articulate or to understand what was about to hit them in a way. And, uh, and so there was what I felt was this kind of great assertive confidence in the idea that things would work out and that what we needed was the belief that they would work out. But if you thought about it, it was the same thing during communism. So you, we were told, you know, there was freedom and it, it wasn't completely realized because we were only in socialism, not in communism. Communism was the kind of society that we had to transition to, to be fully free. So there was a process and a march and an ideal and there was a cost of that march. And it was the same thing under liberalism. You were, there was a process and an ideal and there was a cost to that transition as well. So the reason I ended up with this um, very skeptical view of how of both democracy and freedom and how institutions realize this uh, freedom is in part, I guess, the awareness of how ideology and propaganda work and how they work in different systems. So the idea that you get presented with certain concepts and the media writes about them in a certain way or the schools talk about them in a certain way or the political institutions are introduced as um, reflecting these ideas. But actually, the lived reality and the lived experience of the people who uh, surround you is very different and sometimes opposed to how these ideals are presented. And so, again, when I think about the experience of my friends, for example, who left the country or people who were smuggled outside Italy on boats, if you think about freedom of movement, the idea that, you know, under communism, we didn't have freedom of movement because we weren't allowed to leave the country. And then suddenly we were told we were free. But when you thought about it, and people died crossing the Adriatic, that's not really freedom of movement either, because it doesn't really matter. You know, you don't really have the freedom to exit. It doesn't mean anything if you don't have freedom to enter. And so I became really aware of the kind of deep paradoxes of how this word was used, and of the fact that it could be used in this very ideological way in these different systems to talk about something that was ultimately a failure of realization of that idea. So it didn't really matter. And I have this radical view also when I talk about immigration, you know, debates in immigration and kind of things that write about freedom of movement. Everyone says to me, how can you say that, you know, it's symmetrical, whether you have freedom to exit and freedom to enter, these are very different things. But for me, they're both lacks of freedom. You know, you, you could say you're not allowed to leave or you could say you're not allowed to enter. And none of these systems has actually occupies the moral high ground because the consequences for the individual ultimately are the same, you know, whether you are die, whether you die because you're shot at the border or whether you die because your dinghy sinks, you're dead. And so, and so, and you are unfree when you're dead. So, um, this is what sort of brought these ambivalences and this way of thinking that is very sort of radical and in some ways also very radical in its disappointment with how this um, system, the liberal system also um, promised but failed to realize freedom. Is there uh, an attempt to save the word, word freedom for the left in, in this book or in your work? Um, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, you may end up there, but it's not the premise of my argument. So I am interested in, in freedom as a moral concept, and I'm interested in ideas of agency and responsibility, and I'm interested in a particular conception of freedom, which is the, I guess, the Kantian conception of freedom, which is that you are free insofar as you are a moral agent and uh, and to live in a free world is to live in a world in which people don't instrumentalize and brutalize each other but where they sort of treat each other as as ends in themselves this is a kind of Kantian idea so the philosophical core is uh, is one that I don't think you can easily say you know is it left or is it right but then when you think through how you institutionalize that um, ideal I think you end up with a very radical democratic conception of what kind of institutions are able to uh, realize freedom. And it turns out, in my view at least, that a capitalist system can't have these institutions. Because if you have these very deep asymmetries of power and distribution of ownership structures, and you have a kind of globalized system 
where the agency of particular countries is hindered because of how you know international institutions work, because of power relations, because of the legacy of colonialism, because of uh, you know the, all the failures of the international order and how it was instantiated and how the state system is connected to the historical development of the capitalist system, then you realize that this very radical democratic idea ideal is not at all reflected in institutions that are committed to capitalism at this legal, um, constitutional, or political level. And so, because I don't believe that democracy and capitalism are compatible, and because I'm a radical democrat, I'm at least an anti-capitalist. And then, you know, what does it mean to be an anti-capitalist? Then you have to kind of recover the anti-capitalist tradition to articulate that project and to think about what it means today for, for the left or for whoever is interested in the project, really. It doesn't need to be a kind of... Uh, I mean, it, it, it happens to be a project of the left, but to me, what's interesting about it is that someone who cares about freedom should be committed to this project. And then, you know, where they end up with a label, it's not that relevant. You call it moral socialism, the, the framework of your thinking? Yeah, I guess I would call it. I mean, there is a tradition of thinking in, uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the 20th century, early 20th century. There were some authors that were Kantians and then also Marxists and who tried to... Um, to recover this sort of moral core of Marxism by going back to Kant and trying to connect this idea, the sort of Kantian idea of the self-sufficiency of reason and of this world in which we are sort of reciprocally ends for each other. The kingdom, Kant calls it the, the kingdom of ends and who try to build a connection between that philosophical ideal and then a political system which is quite close to how socialists talk about the world and how they talk about the you know, self-sufficiency of reason and individuals that kind of emancipate themselves from the uh, from different kinds of authorities and from dogma and superstition and so on. So yeah, I kind of go back to that tradition of neo-Kantians and Austro-Marxists, this sort of uh, small minority of, I guess, Kantian Marxists who were uh, also, I mean, who were anti-capitalists and were Marxists, but were anti-capitalists and Marxists not because they had, uh, you know, not because they were historical materialists, but because they start with this philosophical idea of what, what does it mean to realize freedom in history, and then historical materialism is the consequences. So it's a slightly different way of operating with the categories from how a more uh, traditional Marxist, I guess, would operate, where you think, you know, justice and all these values, these are all ideology and dogma. So that's a slightly different way of thinking about it. Whereas I think for the Kantians, you could still talk about values and you can still talk about reason, and you can still have a kind of critical core that is the grounds on which you can then uh, construct a philosophical and political discourse to, um, to challenge the system. Is that the connection then between the two books that coincidentally come out in this, in this fall? So the, 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 book, the autobiography free and then the book Architectonic of Reason, the Kantian book, or the book about Kant's critique of pure reason? Yeah, definitely. So this is how I started. I started, I was interested, so I, I, I went to study philosophy in Italy and I was interested in, uh, in liberalism and in critiques of liberalism, so I became interested in Marx and I was especially interested in the kind of philosophical core of Marx's project, which is the critique of uh, religion and uh, where, you know, you begin to see the departure from Hegelianism and the, uh, the beginnings of Marxism as a kind of original theory. And I discovered that you don't really, you can't really understand Marx's critique of religion until you understand Hegel, and you can't really understand Hegel until you understand Kant's uh, critiques, and in particular Kant's project on the unity of reason, and this idea that reason is something that is constantly engaged in this dual fight against both skepticism on the one hand and dogmatism on the other. And so my, my Kant book is really an effort to try and think about, okay, what is the authority of reason? How does reason have this authority? How can you think systematically? And how can reason retain this authority while also being always prone to error? So how do you kind of learn, how does reason learn from its own mistakes? And how does it uh, be, how can it be both the source of authority, also the source of critique? And this is kind of slightly weird, um, but also very interesting, I think, philosophically um, project. So that's how, um, yeah, so that's how I ended up with Kant from kind of going backwards from Marx to Hegel to Kant and then going back, going forward again after I got to, um, to the critique of reason and to this idea of reason as authoritative to try and then think once you have this philosophical critique, how does it reflect in institutions again? How, does it, how do you think of history? And how is that connected to your interest in, in progress? Um, I think that's something that you... We'll work on here in Hamburg. Um, I guess it's 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 
based on some idea of enlightenment or, or on, on, on the progress of reason, but the skepticism is is quite quite strong in your analysis, I guess. So can you can you explain that that project or political progress? Uh, how yes, it yes. So so the the framework. project was to try and think about uh, how can you what what does it mean to speak of political progress, and uh, in part the, the it starts as a very immediate political concern. You know, we witness protest movements and you witness kind of resistance against the system. And these different movements that we see are, uh, they can be very different. And we often try as, you know, philosophers, people engaged in politics, we try to distinguish between progressive and regressive movements. And so we want to say that, you know, the Trump supporters who are storming the Capitol are on less uh, plausible moral grounds than, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests who are uh, defending the rights of blacks to be included and to be de democratically represented. And so, and, and, we, and also when we look at the history of institutions and the history of democracy, we also want to say that, we, that this was a progressive moment. So we want to say, for example, that women getting the vote was a progressive moment or that, you know, people in the colonies being... Um, having the right to self-determination, this was a progressive moment. So we often intuitively use these categories and we often use the language of progress. This is one side of the story. The other side of the story is that the tradition that we refer to in thinking about progress, which is the enlightenment and this idea of reason as being authoritative and so on, that very tradition has often also been used to oppress other people and to civilize and to emancipate and to speak of our duty towards the barbarians who don't have this conception of reason and, and progress. And so progress is a very is both very very da very dark, but also uh, something that you can mobilize for um, for things that seem legitimate and morally justified. So I'm interested in thinking through this idea of progress not uh, necessarily as a sort of set of values and concepts that we always know, you know, these are right, but rather as this idea of kind of learning from the trials and failures of the past. So learning from history and seeing history as this piling of mistakes, but also as a process from which we can learn when we think about the future. And this was something that was very important to me when I wrote uh, Free, because I wanted to talk about the history of socialism and the history of liberalism not just as, you know, they are there and it's all bad and it all has to be condemned, but rather if we don't engage with this history in the right way and with the right critical lens, then we can't learn from it. And if we always say, well, this wasn't really liberalism when you talk about the failures of liberalism, when you talk about, you know, the collapse of markets in Albania in 97, people would say, oh, but this wasn't really liberal. This is just like, you know, some kind of brutalization of liberalism. Or when you think about socialism, people will say, oh, this wasn't really socialism. You know, this was just a kind of barbarian form. Then I feel... If we kind of detach ourselves from these lived historical experiences and say this is not really what the ideals were, then we never really learn because my impression is that these ideals, whenever they become history and whenever they become reality, there is always a danger that they get perverted, distorted, and that, you know, when, um, when, they, when they become part of real structures. So this is why I, I thought it was important to engage with the history in a way that wasn't just sort of pushing back and saying this is not my history but also that wasn't apologetic and wasn't, um, yeah, so, so trying to kind of steer a middle ground between these two things. Is that um, in some way what you would say, what, what you would mean when you use the term activist political theory? Um, can you explain that, yeah. that term? Yeah, basically, uh, I use the term activist political theory to talk about a particular way of thinking about, you know, what is the role of intellectuals in a political world that is marked by conflicts and where are these different, always these different interpretations of what justice requires and, you know, what is the right side of justice? Is it the state or is it uh, the, the world at large? Or, uh, and, and, and so I, I talk about this to try and explain what is the role of theory and what is the right way for a theorist to engage with these processes in the real world in a way that can melt, that can both uh, feed into the theory, and so you can kind of observe this historical process and observe these conflicts and try to think about their grounds and causes and so on, and then use them as a way of stimulating philosophical reflection, articulating these conflicts, and then then the theories, and I call it a sort of dialectical process, where after you have the theory, then this again feeds back into the institutions, and so you have this um, constant back and forth in the dynamic. And in this sense, the uh, the, the the political, the activist political theorists, and that's why the book is called kind of um, avant-garde um, 
agency, global justice and avant-garde agency, because I try to talk about the role of theorists as in, in the same way in which you can think about the role of artistic avant-garde, where you think about the role of committed artists who try to uh, make art and to create products which can help people sort of raise their consciousness and make them more aware of, uh, of the conflicts that they experience. So the the idea for me is that the sort of activist political theory is a kind of politically engaged theorist in a way in which an artist is or can be politically engaged or can can use their art to sort of stimulate reflection and to um, yeah to raise sort of social critique to raise the standards of social critique. Well, I would say the the book free sort of ventures into that realm of art itself. So that's an exploration of of that potential maybe for for writing about these uh, these issues um maybe one last question was there something that you learned writing this book that surprised you looking back um yeah i did actually learn something yeah, it, it sounds very trivial when i say it but i learned that um uh, that the past never goes away and this is I mean, it's not, you know, maybe it's not that it's not particularly new or anything particularly interesting to say. It doesn't mean it's but, wrong, uh, but it uh, doesn't mean it's irrelevant. Uh, but no. Right, that, that you're kind of, that you're always haunted by your past and that in some ways the connections are always very deep. And I thought I had, you know, I had moved out of Albania. I had sort of left the country many, many years ago and my work was very global for a very long time. I was uh, writing things that with a kind of international audience in mind and so on. And I never thought that what I was writing was actually so deeply connected to actually my background and my experiences in Albania and my family life. And so what I discovered was almost this sort of ge the genesis of my thought was in this very small context in this little Albanian seaside town. And, and that could explain basically everything I say and write. And that was a sort of um, a discovery, not necessarily a pleasant discovery, but yeah, it was a discovery that, you know, is there now. So. And the last question we always ask for me this is personal our whole conversation was basically about that but if you would have to sum it up in one short phrase for me this is personal because um well for me this is personal because history is always personal okay thank you um looking forward to seeing you in hamburg next time and uh have a great summer in the meantime Thank you. Great. Thank you.